Today we have the pleasure of welcoming Lois Ann Yamanaka, the author of a book of poems, Saturday Night at the Pahala Theater, and many novels including Wild Meat and the Bully Burgers, Heads by Harry, Blues Hanging, Father of the Four Passages, and Behold the Many. Books for younger readers include Name Me Nobody, The Heart's Language, and Snow Angel, Sand Angel. She is the recipient of several awards, including the American Book Award, Pushcart Prizes, Lannan Literary Award, Hawaii Award for Literature, and the Elliott Cades Award for Literature. Lois Ann Yamanaka emphasizes that it is important to have a voice rich in language and culture, shares her writing process, and explains how essential poetry is in many genres. Her words carry inspiration and wisdom for writers at any point in their journey, regardless of experience, genre, and point of view. Join us in a space for creativity. Welcome to The Reading Room. So basically, you you write a lot. You know, we love your work. Yeah, <laughs> your Thank poems you. and stories. You know, they they have a setting in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Um, so, how would you describe your work, and uh, what do you write about? You know, um, I want to say that I write my truth. It's not the truth, yeah. but what I um, experience and what. Uh, the different events in my life, I start from that, you know, mm -hmm. and then in order to build fiction or poetry, we're too boring, or I'm too boring, for it to just stand, the experience just stands as something poignant. And then so what I have to do is, some of it is the whole truth. Mm -hmm. Some of it is I grew a corn stalk from the kernel of truth, or I, um, some of them has a root system, some of them have fruit, you know, in order to make it work on the page. So, but that whole thing about the truth and my truth, and are these my experiences and events? Yes, mm. you know, Yeah. but I, I'll never admit to that. I mean, <laughs> what degree, yeah. you know, or who who I composited or. Mm, that, that's a good point in, yeah. in terms of the, the creative process, mm -hmm, you know. Mm -hmm. I know like a lot of people ask like, is this the truth or is yeah. it not, you know, yeah. but it's not really just one or the other. Yeah, it's yeah. like a yeah. blend of, right. you know, different right. things. Yeah, good point. I think that people like to see us through a lens. And so, um, but for Asian Americans, it seems like they, people perceive it as the truth. Yeah. And was that you bowing before the shrine of your mother? You know, I, and I always answer, that's like me asking Joyce Carol Oates, was that you in that Chevy convertible driving through the cornfield with your, your cousin? Mm -hmm. You know, we wouldn't do that. Yeah. But people like to have that window into Asian American mm -hmm. culture and life. And, yeah, that's a good point, and it's yeah. not really um, fair, you yeah. know, because if it's it was not. any yeah. other, you know, person, right. then we wouldn't ask the same exactly. questions, right? Um, yeah, thank you. Um, I noticed that a lot of times when writers come here, mm. they have influences uh, mm. of other authors or mm. other writers um, that they take into consideration in their own work. Do you oh, have yeah. any uh, authors that influenced your writing? You know. Um, what I do is there's a constellation of writers for each book. And so they inform me on structure, they inform me on like a, thir a first third person omniscient, mm -hmm. you know, and then I'll find a book or I'll be given a book or the constellation forms itself. And it's very amazing the process when you open yourself up like that to receiving. And um, so every book has its own its own sur surrounded by the bubble of stars and then I, I take flashback how to do a seamless flashback you know and then the book will come and then how to do short little stories that are prose and 
you know, I'll find a book or somebody will give me a book and the constellation forms itself. Wow. Yeah. I, I love how you're, when you're reading different authors, you know, you're, you're taking their techniques yeah. and you're using yeah. that in, in your oh, own story. Oh, that's how. Yeah. 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 That's yeah. so great. Yeah. Oh, and, and there's a lot of memorable scenes in, in your books. Mm -hmm. Do you have a favorite book or a favorite story or poem? Uh, and if um, so, what, why is that your favorite? <laughs> You know, uh, what you call that? Uh, I uh, always answer that my favorite book is the book I'm currently writing. Because what happens is when I finish a book and I have a ceremonial last period moment where I stop, and I take a deep breath and I just thank God and I thank all the spirit guides, everybody who helped me write the book. And then I very deliberately put the last punctuation mark. And at that moment, um, I celebrate myself. Because it, it can be at 12 noon, it can be, you know, 7 in the morning, and everybody else is at work. So I prepare for that. I get a bottle of something that I want, like a good red, and I just toast myself. <laughs> and the way I see books is that when um, they leave my door, so I, it's like saying goodbye to your child who's going to college. I cannot accompany my child in every college classroom, in every high school classroom, every middle schooler. I, there's no way. They, they need to go and live their own lives. And I say goodbye to them and I wish them well. So that I'm not burdened by that kind of, um, you know, worry or concern or criticism or praise. It's just all outside already. Oh, that's such good advice because I think a lot of writers uh -huh. or um, you know uh, people who want to you know follow the craft of writing that that's one of the concerns like mm -hmm. what other people might think or anything. Mm -hmm. But I love how you you celebrate the end of it yeah. and it's let let it go, yeah. right? It yeah. has its own life. Yeah. Oh, great! It's its own ent entity. Like your child is going to get married and your child's going to have you know different meet different kinds of trials or be honored or but really it's the child mm -hmm. you know your work was done yeah, yeah goodness speaking about um the children <laughs> which is our, our work uh, do you mind reading a, a little bit of your work oh okay thank you the piece that i'm going to read is from um blues hanging and blues the inception of blues hanging was this story that i'm going to read told to me by my friend in college so it was a poem and I decided, okay, let's take this poem and see where it goes. So this is Blue talking. And he says, Blue says to Maisie under the house one day, nobody like be my friend. I eight years old and I got to play by myself. I was cooking all the time and you in the house picking fleas off your black dog. Oh, I like to wear my red cowboy hat and my silver cowboy guns in the plastic holster, but Evangeline and Blendeline teased me because I had to make extra holes in the belt with the ice pick so it could fit around my stomach part. Henry Lynn and Trixie behind them laughing small kind. It's a confession to a girl who never speaks. They sit under the house an apple crate between them. So what if I fat? I saw a lot of fat cowboys in Clint Eastwood movies, even if they was mostly the cook. They think I look dumb, but I need somebody, just one guy to be the bad guy, but I was in the kitchen and evangeling them hiding in the gully. Maisie laughs uncomfortably. He tells me what happens next. Evangeline then was by the Portuguese man's chicken coop smoking cigarette butts. So I sneak attack them, but they hear me coming because the cinders by the mustard cabbage patch crunch when I walk. Then them all four, they run away. Somebody tell real loud, we go catch earthworms under the chicken coops. So I go try to find them by the old man's backyard, but I know they're trying to reverse cycle me. Every time I used to bite. I go where they say they tell loud they gonna be. And when I reach there, only me stay with my Folgers can. 
Yesterday, Evangeline's Uncle Paulo went make one real cowboy hang on high noose and went leave them on their front porch. So I went steal them. And I make pretend I was the bad guy and the good guy wouldn't catch me. Then I went turn into the good guy and then throw the rope over the, with the noose over one kind of high branch on our mango tree. But when I came the bad guy, I no could reach. So I came the good guy again and I went pile the cement blocks that Poppy used for his orchids under the noose. You're gonna hang, partner. I say with the good guy voice, slay you in hell. I say with the bad guy voice, then I will look both ways, up and down the road, and I will give one last, <laughs> and then I will jump. The rope went snap tight around my neck, and I felt all the blood stuck in my head. I va, I try, I va. But what one whisper, I was hanging for real. My feet was dangling. What is, is it? I was thinking, I'm going to die for real right here on the mango tree with my whole head turning purple and hot like hell. Holy shit, now I did it for real. And Poppy going to kill me, but maybe he too late because I'm going to kill my own self. I promised my veins in my head was throbbing and my face was burning up fast. Then the branch went broke and I went tumble, branch and all, on the cement blocks. So I no could loosen the noose and I no could take the rope off the branch. I'm crazy, I was yelling, but you guys never come. So you know what I did? I went drag the mango tree branch still stuck to my neck all around ranch camp until I found Poppy talking story by Mr. Bernardino's pig pen. You damn stupid kid, he said, and he cut the rope off my neck with his po pocket knife. Then Poppy went slap my head. So... That's my friend's story. Wow, that's amazing. Oh my goodness. It's, it's so, like, I really appreciate the way you say it, you know. You, the way you read it, it just comes alive, right? The words Thank come you. alive. You know, it's a life of the mm. words. Oh my goodness. So, it's so authentic, right? So, I know when, when you write, it's with standard English, but also Hawaii Creole English mm -hmm. Pidgin. Mm -hmm. How do you maintain that authenticity? Because when we hear it, it's like for real, yeah, you know. Yeah. How do you maintain that? You know what I came to realize, and I had to learn this, that um, language and culture are so interconnected. So people that are banned from using the language, they lose connection to culture. So if you look at the Ainu, they couldn't speak their language. The culture, there's a revival of the oral tradition, but there isn't a written language. But so, because that's our connection. So um, your first language is your skin, and underneath that are your emotions and feelings and experience that are connected to that language. So when you, um, so when we try to, you know, censor ourselves basically, it, it, we lose, it becomes vicarious. You know, and it's, we're not connecting to our own truth, which is embedded in language. Oh, I, I'm so glad that you talk about language and identity and culture, because I know like a lot of, for a lot of readers, a lot of writers, their first language is pidgin, yeah. right? Yes. And you know, to try to take that away, you know, some people feel like they cannot be themselves, yeah. right? Yeah. And because and you lose the connection to culture, family, neighbors, relatives, you know, experiences, because it's all in that language. Wow. Yeah. So, so when you write, is it um, like when when you hear the pigeon? Mm -hmm. Is it like when you're writing, you're just recording the pigeon that you hear? Is that? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I see. It's kind of a very stream of consciousness and I'm able to access where we need to go when we write, and that's somewhere inside ourselves, it's here, you know, and 
in order to access that part of ourselves, the, the only way to get there is with first language. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, it's very hard to write when you are not allowing yourself to do that. Oh, thank you. That's a good point because I know a lot of writers, they, they want to get it right, you mm -hmm. know, and then they're mm -hmm. like hampering themselves because like, no, 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 not that way, not that way. But they should just free themselves mm -hmm. and just write the mm -hmm. way they hear themselves. Right. You know, speaking of writing, um, I know you have a lot of books, um, poems, short stories, but a lot of times they've been um, translated, you know, into plays or uh, film. And well, what is your experience with that process? It's kind of weird because I sit in the high, in the high chairs, you know, in the back. Of, so I, I'm looking down, and I'm. My experience was, I'm not saying I'm God, but it's like what uh, the Greeks must have saw, the Greek gods, you know, just moving pawns around and, you know, and then it's kind of an out of body experience. Mm. So it's, it's such an interesting process. Yeah. Do, do you, um, I know you say that when you finish writing a book, you kind of let it go. Um, do, do you let go different versions of it? Like say you finish the book um, and then you let that go, but now you see the theatrical version or the play version or the mm -hmm. film version. So do you, do you keep that separate as a different entity? Once I give my permission, I'm just saying, take my child, oh. you know? So, and I have a, to me, trusting the people who do the stage adaptation is such a huge part of the process for me because I completely put my work and I trust them to do the best that they would do with it. So with Kayo, you know, I, I really trusted her. I, and with um, John Watt and Keith Kashiwara, I really trusted them to, um, to adapt the book. Mm. And I think that's part of the me not even being a part of it. I don't want to even be a part of it. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, your, your topics, um, when, when you write, there's a lot about family struggles, you know, abuse, hardships. Mm -hmm. Is there a topic that you would not write about? No. Oh. You know, I made three rules when I decided that, you know, I'm going to do this thing. And I started with poetry. And I told myself, and I followed these three rules for most of my career. Um, number one, I'm never going to let someone censor me again. Mm -hmm. Number two, I will never censor myself again. Mm -hmm. And number three, I'm going to give back as generously to the gift that was given to me mm -hmm. in such magnitude that um, I want to give it back. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I just en enjoy that part because I get to meet kids and I get to meet old people and, you know, all, all different kinds of people. And um, so I live by that. So is there a subject I will not touch? No. Mm -hmm. I touch everything because it's my truth. Mm -hmm. If it... Because um, I know censorship is a big uh, topic, especially nowadays, mm -hmm. you know, a lot mm -hmm. of talk about uh, what should be there, what shouldn't be there. Mm -hmm. um, it, it almost sounds as if if anything was centered, censored, there would be a regret for that censorship. Yeah. And it's best yeah. just to keep on writing what you write. Right, oh, right, right. I, I know we talk a lot about the writing process, mm -hmm. right, especially with students and mm -hmm. uh, people who like they have that passion to write. Yeah. And I know you, you touched on, on your writing process. Um, if you kind of, kind of could explain in detail like your, your process, the process itself, and would it be different, uh, the writing process for a poem or a, a story or a novel? Does it vary? Um, to me, all good writing begins in poetry. So I tell um, writing students, you might have a good story, but if you don't know how to use language, everything, the essay, the novel, the short story, you're gonna write a, no uh, you're gonna write a story for uh, the New York Times, whatever you're doing, it needs a foundation in poetry. 
um, after that, I tell my students, you know, they, they will write about the same topic. So I call that dancing around the fire. So I said, you can spend your whole life dancing around the fire. Oh, look at the flames. Okay, so we get that. Oh, it makes me so warm. Okay, we can get that. Oh, look at the sparks. They're so pretty. Okay, we got that. I said, but you know, you know what's in the fire? You, you better jump in the fire and you have no regard to what's going to happen to you. So you might burn to ash and somebody might stomp you in the ground, but if you don't, jump into the fire, this is a cliche, but then you know the, the phoenix comes out of the fire. Mm -hmm. And so that's what you got to get to. You can spend your entire career dancing around the fire. And um, really, until you take that leap of faith and go in, you know, you might as well just write the family Christmas newsletter, which is so annoying to me. You know. This year, Brucey went to law school and met a wonderful girl. I don't care. But if you spent that energy and you jumped into the fire, that's different, mm. you know? Yeah, that, that's a good point. And, and it sounds like it's more authentic too because you're just going for it. You're not yeah. thinking about if I should write it or like right. dancing around, right. you know? Right. Right. Oh, that's so great. Mm. Also, I know like there's a lot of different settings in your work, yeah. right? There's like Hilo, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, there's um, you know Kalihi Valley. Um, what kind of research do you do like before working on a, a on a creative piece, or what kind of research do you? Um, research do? is a double-edged sword because it's so fascinating and it just. Um, it's all in it. I get engrossed in the research, oral histories. I go into photo archives and then, you know, I fact check and I get all this research that almost it gets to the point where I'm not even writing the book. So I have to deliberately say, okay, the research stops after this topic. And then I got to now work on the book because research in and of itself is so it it blows my mind mm -hmm. and i enjoy learning about those time periods or people and events and you know putting the pieces together so i got to deliberately say stop mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah yes. sure yeah. you know um and for like once you like you you've written a lot of books and I know, like a lot of times, beginning writers sometimes they're concerned about writer's block. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if there's anything that might stop me from writing, mm -hmm. and they're eager to learn what the cure is. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. so like if say someone were to have writer's block, well, what would you recommend or what would you say to that uh, writer? I would say go back to your initial impulse for writing. Mm -hmm. Why did you first start writing? Yeah. So like Eric uh, Chalk told me. Oh, po poetry is free therapy, yeah? And so what I did coming back after, you know, my business closed, um, I went back to initial impulse, and that was poetry. Oh, yeah. And so I came back through that avenue, and then it all started rolling again. Yeah, so there's a lot of other things that I do, you know, but that was the most important motion I made, go back. Why did I start? Yeah. yeah. I, I love that. Why did I start? Because a lot of times writers are writers for a reason. Yes. There's a passion or some motivation. Yes, yes. Um, and because like, not, not everyone has that passion, right? right? right. It's not like you're born and so, some people are like, ah, I'm like, right. Yeah, <laughs> not yeah, the one yeah. to do it. And someone's like, I got to write, you yeah. know? So, yeah, go yeah. back to that. Wow. Yeah. That's good advice. Um, now, think of, you know, before all of the publications, mm -hmm. um, and someone who has that passion uh, and they want to be a writer, uh, what advice do you have for someone who wants to write? What advice? My jump in the fire one. Mm, yeah, and yeah. Um, no sense of yourself. Mm. Um, I think writers are born. Yeah, so we have writers, poets, we have good storytellers, you know, so 
whatever genre you would like to attempt, I believe firmly that everything starts in poetry. So if you go back to school, you take poetry, poetry workshops, and then everything will fall into place. Because if you read essays, good essayists are poets, you know, and if you read good short stories, they're poets. And I like to make the distinction between a good storyteller because their work is, you know, there's passion, mm -hmm. but there's also art. And to be an artist, I think you, your foundation is in reading poetry and understanding poetry, uh, understanding line and movement, sentence by sentence, beat by beat, you know, being very, very precise, even when writing a 400-page novel. That, that's such a good point because I know a lot of times when um, you know you have uh, people who are interested in the novel and mm -hmm. um, want want to be a novelist, they're like so focused on the plot or the mm -hmm. you know character mm -hmm. or you know and they're like oh but what about the word you yeah. know so yeah. I, I like your um, you know melding or you know yeah. of of all of that wow and I I know another question that comes up with uh, writers uh, about book publication. Did you have like any like advice or um, of what, what a first-time writer should do in regards to publishing their work? I think that writing, in and of itself, is the reward. Yeah. And when we look toward publication of our work, um, we lose purpose and passion, and. Um, so I have a strong faith in small presses because that's where the real writers are. Mm -hmm. You know, and th the publishing landscape is horrible now, horrible. So big houses, because of capitalist venture, that um, they need um, the John Kuntzes. Mm -hmm. They need yeah. the, you know, the, the, the ones who will bring, bring a big return, Dean Kuntz, you, you know, so literary fiction has not found a place except in good middle size and good small presses. That's where the literary fiction exists. But now it's like to s every book that you go out with or that I go out with, it's like I'm starting brand new from scratch. Like when I was 27 years old, there's no name recognition, there's nothing because the bottom line is the dollar. Mm, yeah. So, you know, young writers, they all want to be published. They want to have a book come out, blah, blah, blah. You know, um, it's good to hold mm. in hopeful expectation, but not when you're writing, mm. you know. Yeah. You're writing for yourself. Well, there's a larger purpose than that. Mm. I, I love how you mentioned the larger purpose and why you're writing, mm -hmm. because it, it sounds like if that purpose or that intent is kind of uh, distracted yeah. by like the dollar or yeah. the royalties yeah. or what have uh, you, uh, it kind of watered that waters down, right, you know, the right, writing itself. Right, and right. I, I love how you mentioned small presses, uh -huh, you know, where uh -huh. they have like, um, uh, like uh, a mission, you yeah. know, to yes. publish these yes. voices, these strong, yes. uh, authentic voices. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Wow. Oh goodness! <laughs> Thank you so much, Lois <laughs> and Yamanaka, for joining us in the reading room. A lot of great advice. This is such a wonderful opportunity for me and your crew and everyone that's working and collaborating to make this happen. This set is fabulous. Um, so thank you. Thank you for including me. I feel really honored. Well, thanks for joining us. We appreciate your advice, for sharing your voice. And oh, there's, there's no words sometimes. <laughs> thank you so much. And thank you, everyone, for joining us for another episode of The Reading Room.